Go ahead and have a seat. It's an honor today. I get to preach to you. I get to preach on the church, and we get to experience church in here today. I, mean, I had a number of different churches on the stage today. How about a round of applause for our worship team this morning, leading us into the presence of God. And thank you guys so much. I was talking to Kirkland, who was standing over here on this side, and uh, he used to go to vacation Bible school at Paul Land when he was a kid, man. So a uh, reunion for him to get to come back and, and sing. And uh, what a blessing it is to do it, man. So I appreciate you guys being here, man, gathering together, lift up Jesus in this place. Welcome those of you on the live stream as well. Before I jump into this message on the church, I just want to say thank you to my wife, Cindy. She heads up the women's ministry here at Paul Land Church. And this past yesterday, she did a conference Friday and Saturday called Meet Me in the Bible Conference, which was so great. And babe, I just want to say thank you for doing that, man. I really appreciate that. Very well done, you and your team. And uh, it was personally fantastic for me. Well, if you got your Bible, open it up to Hebrews chapter 10 and Acts chapter 9. I'm going to start in Hebrews 10. I'm going to jump to Acts chapter 9. I'm talking about the church today, the bride of Christ, sometimes referred to as the bride of Christ. It's the body of Christ. It's the household of God. It's a temple of God of which we are living stones being built upon a foundation of the prophets and the apostles upon the cornerstone of Jesus. We are the talking about the church, right? The first time it's mentioned in the Bible is Matthew chapter 16. Jesus takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. He's been with them for about two and a half years. Caesarea Philippi is as far north in Israel as you can get. And there's a number of temples there, temples to pagan gods. There was a temple to Caesar there, a temple to Pan there. They believe that this was the gateway to the underworld. There was a big cave there with a big spring in it. And at that spot, Jesus asked the question, man, who do people say that I am? And the apostles answered him. They said, well, some say you're John the Baptist and others say Jeremiah or Elijah or one of the other great prophets. And then Jesus asked the question, which we all have to answer, man, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that Jesus is? To the apostles, who do you say that I am? And this is in Matthew 16, 17. The apostle Peter, speaking for all the apostles, says, man, we believe you're the Christ, the son of the living God. We believe you're the Messiah, the son of God, God himself in the flesh. We believe you're the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus responds, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my father who is in heaven, and you are Peter, you are Petrus, the small pebble, you are Peter, but upon this rock, the Petra, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And the question is, this rock that Jesus is referring to, the great confession of faith in his name, that he is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, that the church is built upon Jesus. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that there is no other foundation except Jesus upon which can be built. He is the rock on which the church is built. I've been in churches literally around the world. I was born in a small country church. I'm pastor of Paul and Church. I've been in churches in Nepal, India, China, Africa, Jordan, South America. I've been in churches. They all have different customs. They have different they, they look different, they speak in a different language, but if it's a true church, man, it's always lifting up Jesus, all right? This is a re reflection of a true church. They lift up Jesus Christ. It is the church of God, all right, that we lift up. And I want to show this to you. There are a couple of Greek words for, for the church. Ekklesia is the one that's used in Matthew. Ekklesia, it comes from the root to call out. It means the called out ones, those that have been called out by Jesus. There's also a word in the Hebrews, I'm going to read in just a minute, episynagod, and it means those that assemble or those that gather together, the assembling together. So the church are the ones that have been called out by God through Jesus and assemble together in his name to lift up the name of Jesus. Those that have been called out and assemble together. Now, one of the more famous passages of scripture on church is found in Hebrews chapter 10. You'll hear this quoted a lot of times in church. I want to put it in context. So uh, this is in chapter 10, beginning in verse 19. We don't know the author of the book of Hebrews, one of the great mysteries of scripture. We don't know who wrote it, but we do know the theme. And this is the issue. He was writing to second generation believers. So these were believers that had not seen Jesus, but had become a follower of Jesus by hearing about him the same way you have. And they were under intense persecution to stop following Jesus and to go back to Judaism. All right. And so the author of Hebrew writes, and here's what he wants to tell them, 
Jesus is better. Jesus is better. He's better than what you're thinking about going back to. He's better than the alternative. He's better than the angels. He's better than Moses. He has a better covenant. He has a better way. He's a better sacrifice. He's a better Sabbath. He's established a better covenant, a new covenant, and there's a better way to approach God. It's by faith in Jesus. Jesus is just better. Nine chapters he spends telling us that Jesus is better and why Jesus is better. And then he gets to chapter 10 and he makes a turn and he goes, because Jesus is better, now this is how you should live. Because of what Jesus has done for you now, this is how you should live. Chapter 10, verse 19, begins with the word, therefore. Therefore, in light of all that Jesus has done for you, brothers and sisters, talking about believers, talking to the church, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, verse 20, he has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain, that is through his flesh, And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, he says, two things Jesus gives us, man. Number one, he gives us access to the Father, and he gives us an advocate. He is our high priest constantly praying for us and caring about us personally. He gives us access up to the point of Jesus. The presence of God was inside the temple, inside the holy of holies. There was a curtain that separated the outer temple from the inner temple. Inside the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God. Only the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies one day a year on the Day of Atonement. He would take the blood, go inside the curtain, behind the curtain, into the Holy of Holies, sprinkle blood on the Ark of the Covenant, on the mercy seat on top of it, to offer up a sacrifice for the sins of the people. One man, one place, one person that had access to God. If you wanted to approach God, you had to go through a priest. You offered your sacrifice to a priest. He's the one that offered it. He was a mediator between you and God. You couldn't approach God. But when Jesus died on the cross, it says in Matthew 27, 51, at the very minute that Jesus died, when he cried out, to Telestai, it is finished. The moment he said that and gave up his soul, that the curtain in the temple split in two from top to bottom, Matthew 27, 51, that God supernaturally reached down and ripped the curtain in two between the Holy of Holies and the outside temple. Why? Because access to God became available to anybody that's a believer in Jesus. You have access to the Father. You don't have to go through a priest to access the Father. Jesus is your high priest. You can approach him. You can pray with him. You can talk to him. You can feel his spirit when you gather like this to worship, man, the very presence of God. You have access. Because you have access to God, he gives us three imperatives, three commands in a row. Number one, you should draw near, right? Verse 20, 22, let us draw near with a pure heart or a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. We should draw near, right? What would it look like for you personally to draw near to Jesus? How would you do that? So, man, if I wanted to get closer to Jesus, how would I do that? Could I read his Bible more? Could I pray more? Could, could I worship more? Man, you have the privilege, the honor to draw near. He says, man, you should draw near to Jesus with a true heart. Verse 23, let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering since he who has promised is faithful. Let us draw near. Number two, let us hold on to the confession, man. Don't be backing up. Don't be backing down. Don't be deconstructing. Don't be going sideways. Don't be thinking, I'm going to live like the world because that looks pretty attractive right now. Don't be going backwards, man. No, you hold on to the faith. Keep living for Jesus. Jesus is worth it. He's better than whatever the alternative are. You should draw close to him. You should hold on. And verse 24, and let us watch out for one another. We should watch out for one another to provoke, to encourage Other people to love and good works, man. We should watch out for one another. Three imperatives, two reasons why, two reasons to do it. Verse 25, how do you do that? You do not neglect gathering together as some are in the habit of doing. Not neglecting the assembling together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. What day is that? The day that Jesus returns. Oh, can anybody see that approaching? You better get ready for that because Jesus is coming back one day, man. Don't forsake the assembling. There's the word right there. 
Don't stop going to church, man. Don't drop out. Don't come every once in a while, man. Don't forsake the assembling together as some, this is thousands of years ago, or in the habit of doing, although it could have been written to us today. Don't forsake the assembling together as some are in the habit of doing. Now, in my life, I've made a lot of decisions. The decisions we make today determine our future, the course of our life in the future. I've made a lot of decisions in my life. I made a lot of bad decisions in my life. I don't know about you, but I made a lot of bad decisions. I think part of that was my dad was a rancher, and I just grew up with this mentality, dude, that I could do anything. I could ride anything. I could drive anything. I could do anything. So when somebody said, you want to do that, I would always be the guy that say, I'll do that. My dad would say something like, you want to ride that? I'd be, I'll ride that. I'll do that. And I get stomped into the mud puddle by some cow or something. I'll drive that. I'll drink that. I'll do that. Like one time I used to do a lot of snow skiing. I take the college ministry on snow skiing. I don't know if you've ever been snow skiing before or not. It's a lot of fun. And invariably, if you go snow skiing, somebody makes a ramp that you can jump off of it. All right? And some, they, they invented the snowboards, so and they started making these really big ramps that people on skis should not go off of. But invariably, somebody would see a, a deal, and they would say, hey, you want to take that jump? And I'll be like, I'll do that, right? I remember this one time. I took this jump on a ski lift. I was down there. I was going at least 100 miles an hour. That might be a slight exaggeration, but I know I was going at least 99. I was going really fast, all right? <laughs> And I'm going to take this jump, man. I'm just going to hit it, you know, go big or go home. You might as well hit it fast if you're going to hit it. And I hit this jump, and I flew off of it. And as I'm flying through the air, I remember looking down, and the, sk- the tips of both my skis were crossed like this. And right then, a thought went through my, my mind. This was a bad decision. This is a bad decision, man. There's no way this is going to end well. This is a bad decision, man. You ever make a bad decision? I shouldn't have gotten that car with that guy. I shouldn't have went to that party. I shouldn't have made that decision. I shouldn't have dated that person. I should have skipped that on that. We all make decisions in our life that are bad, right? And we pay the price because you can't go back and undo a bad decision. Now, you can learn from it. And I made a bad decision the other day. I'm like, I got to learn, man, to make better decisions, right? But there are two decisions I made in my life that were good, all right? And I'll, honestly, I really can't take credit for either one of them, honestly. But the first one, the decision I made was that I made a decision to accept the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, right? I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and gave my life to Jesus, Right? I was desperate for a change in my life, and I made a decision. And at the time you make a decision to give your life for Jesus, you really don't understand the ramifications of how good that decision is going to turn out for you. And I didn't really think I probably did it very good. I didn't understand everything. I don't think I did a very good job. And, you know, as soon as you get saved, you can look back and you think, well, my life's not really that different. Oh, just hang on. Because giving your life to Christ is like you're going through life on this particular path. You're living your life this way. And somehow, some way, God in his grace gives you an alternative trail off to the side. And when you first hear it, when you hear about this opportunity that Jesus gives you, that Jesus died to pay the penalty of your sin, and when you trust in him, put your faith in him and make him Lord of your life, you can go a different direction, man. You know, it creates a crisis of belief. You have to decide, man, am I going to continue to live like I'm living? All right. And I just want to say, if you continue to live like you're living, then you'll continue to get whatever you're getting. Right? And in my life at that time, I, my life was nothing but chaos and drama and craziness and heartache and just one thing after another. And uh, so, man, I, I made a decision. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, by faith, make a change. And I trusted my life to Jesus. And when you first take that other path, it's not that far to your first path. You can see it right over there, how you used to live. And there's some temptation to go back to it. But the farther, the longer you stay, the difference it makes. Everything that ever good in my life, I can trace back to that moment. That moment changed my marriage. It saved my marriage. It changed my kids. My kids are different because of that decision. Everything in my life was redirected in the moment I gave my life to Jesus. The second decision I made really wasn't my decision either. It actually began with my wife. We made a decision after I got saved that this, man, we just made a decision that as our family, we were going to go to church. We were going to go to church. We just go to church as a family. We just went to church. We never got up on Sunday morning going, we're going to go to church today. 
do we just do when we got up? We were going to church because that's what we do every day. We go to church every Sunday. We just go to church as a family. Never when my kids were in junior high or high school did they get up and like, well, I don't want to go to church today. It wasn't a question. Dude, we're just going to church. That's what we did as a family. We just, we just went to church, right? And you know what, man? Going to church, Jesus changed my life by going to church. I got saved in church. I got discipled in church. I learned to give in church. I learned to pray in church. I learned to study my Bible in church. I got called to the ministry in church. I experienced God in church. I just made a decision to go to church. Now, I want to show you how this works practically in your life, all right? I'm going to do it from this Acts chapter 9 passage. This Acts chapter 9 passage is a famous passage of Scripture, and it's famous for one reason, because this is where Paul the Apostle gets saved. This is where he gets converted, Acts chapter 9, all right? Now, maybe you know a little bit about Saul of Tarsus. He was a Pharisee, and dude, he didn't like Jesus. He thought Jesus was a fake. He thought the whole church movement was a fake. He thought Stephen was lying. He thought the apostles were idiots. He was, he was basically there when Stephen was killed. He agreed with killing the first person, Stephen, the first martyr of the Bible. And he began to persecute the church, arrest people, put them into jail for one reason, because they were followers of Jesus, right? It says he began to ravage the church. It's this picture of a dog just going crazy, man. He was just going through Jerusalem, arresting people, putting them in jail. And then he hears that there's people in Damascus that are followers of the way. He's like, dude, I'm going to Damascus, 150 miles away. I'm going to go to Damascus and arrest those people as well and bring them back to Jerusalem, put them on trial. Why? For being a, a follower of Jesus. Right, And on the road to Damascus, so it took him about a week to walk there. The passage says in chapter 9, verse 3, as he was traveling along and, and nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul said, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, he replied, but get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. Do. Saul is on his way to Damascus and a bright light flashes around him and knocks him down to the ground. I'm here to tell you, bro, that was not a bolt of lightning. That was not a solar flare. That was not somebody with a mirror flashing it in his eyes. It was Jesus himself that showed up as light and knocked him to the ground, right? We see this in the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17. If you're familiar with the story, Jesus takes three of his disciples, goes up on a mountain, and it says there he was transfigured before him. To be transfigured means that whatever is on the inside of you is reflected on the outside of you. It's exactly what Jesus wants to do in your life. He wants to change you from the inside so that it's reflected in how you live on the outside. Jesus went up on a mountain and was transfigured before him, and who he really was on the inside was reflected on the outside, it says in Matthew 17, 20, he was transfigured in front of them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became, became as white as the light. His face began to shine like the sun and his clothes began, became as white as the light. John had a vision on Adam Patmos from which he wrote the book of the Revelation and Jesus showed up and appeared to him in a vision, it says in Revelation 1.16 that Jesus had seven stars, which are the seven churches, in his right hand, a sharp double-edged sword coming from his mouth, and his face was shining like the sun at full strength. Jesus shows up, speaks to the Apostle Paul. How do we know? He tells us himself, 1 Corinthians 15.8, last of all, as to one born at the wrong time, Jesus also appeared to me. Jesus shows up. Knocks him to the ground. It's so bright that it blinds him and he speaks to him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who was, church, who was Paul persecuting? The church. But because the church is the body of Christ. Why are you persecuting me? Get up and go into the city and I'll tell you what to do. This is the, this is the reference of a believer in Jesus. Up to that point, Saul was doing what he wanted to do. From that point on, he was going to be doing what Jesus wanted him to do. To do, Get up and go into the city and you'll be told what to do. Now, I'm not here today necessarily to preach on Paul. I want to preach on this next guy. You, you might not know this next guy. This is the only time he appears in Scripture. He's in uh, Acts 22. Paul referenced him. He shows up, never hear, from his, never hear from him again. His name's Ananias. Verse 10, 
there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord, he said. Get up and go to the street called Straight. The Lord said to him, to the house of Judas, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, since he's praying there. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come in and placing his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard from many people about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority here from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for this man is a chosen instrument to take my name to the Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And Ananias went. My first point is this. When you get saved... You get saved into something. When you get saved, you get saved out of the world and out of isolation into the church. The church is the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. It's a whole new community. It's a redeemed community. Everything changes when you go into the church because the church is made for believers in Jesus only. Therefore, it's all equal in the church. There's race no longer matters. Nationality no longer matters. Politics no longer matters. Everything gets superseded by Jesus, who is the head of this community. Everything overcomes. When you get saved, look, whenever Paul got saved, God didn't say, go back to Jerusalem and go to work. He said, go into the city. What was in the city? The church was in the city. Ananias was in the city. He could not become the apostle Paul by himself because when you get saved, you're not saved in isolation. You are saved into a community. You are saved into a church, right? The church of the living God. In Jesus' mind, there's no differentiation between salvation and the church. The church is the body of Christ. When you get saved, you are in Christ, and Christ is in you, and Jesus is in the church. The church and Jesus, man. So when you get saved, you are saved in the community, and you're saved for a reason. Paul got saved for a reason. He was chosen To go and tell this man, he is my chosen instrument. Why was he chosen? Because God had something for Saul to do, man. And you know what? He called him, he saved him, and he gave him something to do. And the same goes for you. You have a responsibility. When you get saved, man, you're saved into a church. You're planted in that church. And God wants you to flourish in that position so that you can bear fruit. Jesus says, man, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. God has placed you in the church because he's given you particular spiritual gifts, particular abilities that 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 church might function as the body of Christ and carry out the work of the Christ, of Christ through it. When you get saved, you are saved into a church. You are saved into a community of believers. This is what we see with Paul. He gets saved and he gets placed into the church, a new identity, a new family, and a new future, the body of Christ. So when you get saved, you are saved into something to church. And number two, when God has something he wants to accomplish, he usually calls someone out of the church to accomplish it. So when you get saved, you are placed in the church. When God has a task, he calls someone out of the church. So, you know, when he, when he needed to, to, to see the Ethiopian eunuch get saved, he called a guy named Philip. When he needed a pastor in the church of Ephesus, he called Timothy. When he wanted to take the book of Rome, the the book of Romans to the church in Rome, he called a lady named Phoebe. When he wanted to minister to Paul, he called Ananias. God calls us out because he has a task for us to commit because we are in the church of God. One of the problems we have is that we have a low view of ourselves and we have a low view of the church understand who you are, man, as a believer in Jesus. Man, you've been called. You've been chosen. You've been forgiven. You've been redeemed. You've been bought with a price. You've been empowered by the Holy Spirit. You've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. You've been given a spiritual gift. You've been gifted. Why? Because God's got a task for you in the church, which is the body of Christ, which is the bride of Christ, which is the household of God, which Jesus died to establish the church. God put you in the church. He planted you here. If you're a member of Poland, he's planted you here so you can be a blessing to other people, so you can encourage one another, so you can love one another. If you think about that, when you start talking about loving one another, I'm just going to tell you, you can't love your, you can't love other people by yourself. You might grow in your faith outside the church, but you ain't going to grow in love 
Because if by definition, love is something you do for someone else. And that's why God said the number one commandment, Jesus said, love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself because how you love your neighbor is a reflection of how much you love God. And you can't do it unless you're in the church. Right? God put us together that together we might be the body of Christ. Man, you got to be so careful. You got to understand the church. Whenever Paul's on the road to Damascus and, and Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? Who is Paul persecuting? The church. Jesus equates himself with the church. That's why we got to be so careful that we don't criticize a local church. Don't get on social media and criticize a local church because you might find yourself, instead of following Jesus, actually opposing Jesus. Right? Man, God's got a purpose for you. He's got something he wants to accomplish through. He planted you in a church. When you get saved, you get saved into something, and then out of that he calls you. So he's got, here's Ananias, right? He calls Ananias. Ananias, I got something for you to do. And, and Ananias says, here I am. He says, Ananias, here I am. Same exact response, right, that Abraham gave when God called him. Here I am. Same exact response that Moses gave at the burning bush. Here I am. Same exact response that Samuel gave when God called him in the middle of the night. Here I am. Ananias, here I am, Lord. I got something I need you to do. I got a task for you to do. I want you to go into uh, Damascus to a street called Straight, and I want you to find this guy named Saul of Tarsus. He's praying there. I had a, he had a vision. A man's going to come and put his hands on him. And Ananias says, Lord, and I, I heard about this guy, how he's been putting everybody in jail that are followers in Jerusalem, and that he was coming to Damascus. Really, you want me to do that? Now, the definition of salvation is you make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. And if Jesus Christ is Lord of your life, then you do what Jesus asks you to do. And this is the crux of the matter. He didn't really want to do it, right? But is Jesus Lord of his life or not? I don't want to do it, but Lord, if that's what you want me to do, I'll do. And he went and he prayed over Paul. He said he placed his hands on him and said, Brother Paul, verse 17. The Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road you were traveling and sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it wants something like scale from his eyes. He regained his sight and he got up and was baptized. I'm just saying, we baptized three people in first service today. Jesus was baptized. Paul was baptized. If you ain't never been baptized and you're a believer, man, you need to get baptized. Is he Lord or not? Right? Look, whenever Ananias met with Saul, something changed in Saul's life. For all my theologians in the room, you could ask the question about when did Apostle Paul really get saved? Did it happen when he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus? Well, it might have, but he was still blind, and he still didn't have the Holy Spirit, and that didn't happen until Ananias showed up and maybe explained to him the fullness of the gospel, and at that moment, the scales fell off his eyes, he received the Holy Spirit, and he was baptized, he was born again. Something happened in Saul's life when Ananias came into his life, but check this out, something happened in Ananias' life as well. Because you see, the church is how Jesus makes disciples. Number one, when you get saved, you get saved out of the world into something. You get saved into the church, and it's out of the church that God calls people to the task that he has for him because it's the church that makes disciples. It's the church that makes disciples of others, and it's the church that makes you a disciple, and he does it when you begin to serve other people. It was when Ananias went and did what God wanted him to do for Saul that Saul's life was changed, but so was his. Saul got baptized. Who do you think baptized him? I think Ananias did it. Can you imagine just getting old? You do anything with your life, Dad? I led Paul to the Lord and baptized him. Right? Well, that's not bad. Right? See, this is the way it is. When you choose to serve your life, others, God not only makes a disciple out of them, he makes a disciple out of you. Church is not just something to come. See, you can't think that church is here for me. You can't think church is here for me. In reality, you're here for the church. Because if you think church is just for you, then you get a consumer mentality. Then sooner or later, you're going to get mad at the church because I ain't doing what you think they ought to do. But if you're the church and you're here to be a blessing to other people, it's a completely different ballgame. 
And when you start to be the church man, that's where Jesus starts to work in your life to make a difference. Three things in the book of Hebrews we're supposed to do. Draw near to Jesus. Don't forsake and, and love one another. You can only do it in the church. That's why he says, don't forsake the assembling together. Some are in the habit of doing. If you're in a church, man, you're being planted here. You should love people. You should make a difference in their life because here's the reason. You never know what might happen through your actions. You never know the difference you're truly making in the kingdom. Ananias probably had no idea when he went over there and prayed with, with Saul of Tarsus what he was going to accomplish. No idea. No way to know. You never know because God can take the smallest thing and just blow it up. And I just want to close by giving you an illustration. And this guy's name, you, you might have heard of this guy. He's, some people use him as an illustration. His name's uh, Edward Kimball. And he was a Sunday school teacher in uh, 1854. Edward Kimball, a Sunday school teacher, 1854. He's a Sunday school teacher, I believe, in New England. And uh, he was teaching a Sunday school class. And this kid came to a Sunday school class. So he's teaching in the youth group, 17 years old. And uh, the only reason this kid was there, because he'd got a job for his uncle in a boot store. And his uncle said, I'll give you the job, but you have to go to church. So this kid went to church, even though he didn't really want to go to church. He went to a Sunday school class. His Sunday school teacher was Edward Kimball. But Edward Kimball cared about this kid and began to pray for him and made the decision one day, I'm going to go and share the gospel with him. So he went down. He was going to do it about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And he went down to the boot store to share the gospel with this kid. And he, and he got to thinking about it as he went along. And he started kind of getting cold feet. He's like, man, what if I go in there and talk to him? And other people see me and they make fun of the kid or maybe I shouldn't do it. And he's having second thoughts. And then, you know, as he's thinking about it, he walked right by the store. And then he said by his own testimony, they looked up. He noticed he'd, he'd, he'd passed the store. So he turned around and said, in a flash, I decided to go in there and get it over with as quick as I could. So we went into this boot store, went in the back, finds the kid in the back stocking shelves, put his hands on his shoulder, shared the gospel with him. All right. And we shared the gospel with him. He said, I didn't really think I did a very good job. I didn't make it very clear. But to my surprise, the kid turned around and, surprised and, and gave his life to Jesus. The kid got saved that day, 17 years old. Now, this guy's name was Dwight. He's Dwight L. Moody. And he went on to be a pretty famous preacher, D.L. Moody. Maybe you've heard about this guy. He started a church, uh, you know, the Moody Memorial Church in Chicago, one of the largest churches in Chicago in the 1800s. Went on to form the Moody Bible Institute that's still going on today. He has a radio program still in New York. Uh, this, this guy got saved, and, and they, it was so shaky that when he got saved, they put him before the church to let him join, and the church wouldn't even let him join the church for two years. But on Edward Kimball's testimony, they let him finally join the church. The guy goes on to be an evangelist. They estimate that in his lifetime that he led over one million people to the Lord. One million people. D.L. Moody. Got saved by a Sunday school teacher. It's an amazing story, but the crazy thing about it, it, it doesn't even there because Dwight L. Moody preached an evangelistic crusade at a church one time by a guy named J. Wilbur Chapman. He was a unit. And he believed that everybody was going to heaven, so he didn't believe in the gospel. But his congregation wanted Moody to come preach. So Moody came and preached in his church, and through the course of events, the pastor himself got saved, realized he wasn't born again, gave his life to Jesus, started preaching himself in revival crusades. And, and he let another famous evangelist named Billy Sunday got saved in one of his crusades, Billy Sunday. He's a pretty famous guy himself. Billy Sunday, then in a revival, was preaching and another guy that wasn't quite as famous as Billy Sunday, but his name was Mordecai Ham. And Mordecai Ham gave his life at a Billy Sunday crusade, and he started his own revivals. He would do tent revivals. He wasn't ever really as famous as Billy Sunday. But one night in 1936, two men, two young men, 16-year-old, they saw the tent revival going on over there, and one young man said to the other man, he said, let's go over there and see what the wacko has to say. So these two 16-year-olds went to this tent revival, and they got in there. The place was so packed, they couldn't find a place to sit. They made a decision they were going to leave. But just as they were getting ready to leave, an usher walked up to them, put a hand on both their shoulders, and told them, I've got a seat for you. Brought them in, found a seat, set them down. 1936, the one 16-year-old kid gave his life to Christ, Billy Graham. I'm just saying, man, you never know the difference you can make in somebody's life when you just find yourself faithful to do what God's called you to do within a church. It's how God makes disciples. It's how he makes them out of them and how he makes them out of you and he wants to do that in you. So we're going to close our service today. I'm going to ask everybody in here to stand up 
And I'm going to commission everybody in this room to become a missionary of Paul Ann Baptist Church. You're a born again believer. You're in this room today. God's called you to, he's got a task for you. He's got a responsibility for you. He's got a call on your life for a reason. He's called you to take what's been given to you and go give it to somebody else. That might be done a million different ways. You might need to be a greeter, might need to work in the children's department. I don't know what your gifts are, what your talents are, what God has for you. But you're a priesthood of believers. You're a priest. You've got the Holy Spirit living in you. You have the capacity to take what's been given to you and give it on to others. So I'm going to commission you today. Become a missionary of Paul Land Church. Take what God's given to you and give it away to other people. So if you'd bow with me in prayer, I'm going to stretch out my hands over you. Father, I pray for everybody in this room, God. In the name of Jesus, I commission them for all the believers in this room, man, as missionaries of the one true high God and his son, Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray that you would anoint them and fill them and you would use them in their circle of influence, God, and that they would get involved in the church, that they could build up the kingdom of God, the body of Christ, that we might be the hands and feet of Jesus in the city of San Angelo and around the world, God, would you put within them a fire that cannot be put out to make a difference in the kingdom that you might be glorified and your name might be known in the entire world because you, Jesus, are worthy of it. And we give you praise for what you've done for us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody said amen. All right, let's go, man. One last song. Let's give him a little praise.